What if I told you that one of the most advanced tanks of the Cold War, a machine designed for nuclear battlefields with four tracks and a spaceship-shaped hull, isn't just real, but almost perfectly recreated in War Thunder? This is the Object 279, a 60-ton armored fortress built to survive the apocalypse. Today, we're diving deep into this Cold War anomaly, how it was built, what made it so radical, and why War Thunder's version is shockingly close to the real thing. Before we begin, I want to address an important matter regarding one of the sources used for this video. A publication that contains relevant historical data has been blocked in Russia due to local laws classifying certain books and websites as extremist materials. While this does not affect the factual accuracy of the content presented here, it may limit access to the video in certain regions. Should this video become unavailable in specific countries, this is the likely reason. The story begins in the late 1940s, as the Red Army reimagined what tanks would need to look like in a future war. The experience of fighting across the vast, frozen, and swampy landscapes of Eastern Europe had taught Soviet engineers a painful lesson. Even the strongest tanks are useless if they can't move. The result was the Object 726, an experimental platform designed not for combat, but for terrain. It featured a bizarre four-track layout with parallel suspensions on each side. The goal was to drastically reduce ground pressure and allow the vehicle to float over snow, mud, and soft soil where traditional tanks would sink. Although it never received a turret or armament, Object 726 was a proof of concept, mobility over everything. Fast forward to the 1950s, and the battlefield had changed. The dawn of the atomic age introduced a terrifying new variable, tactical nuclear warfare. In 1956, the Soviet Ministry of Defense issued requirements for a new heavy tank that could fight in a post-nuclear environment and resist blast effects. It was no longer enough to have armor and firepower. Survivability in total war became the priority. Thus emerged the Object 279, developed at the Kirov plant in Leningrad by Lev Troyanov's team. Borrowing the four-track concept from Object 726, the 279 took things to a new level. Its elliptical hull was cast in one piece shaped like a spaceship to deflect heat jets and help resist the overturning force of nuclear shockwaves. Its suspension beams doubled as fuel tanks, and its armor up to 319 millimeters of cast steel on the turret, with layered skirts and internal standoff, made it the most protected tank in the world for decades. In fact, Object 279's protection levels were so extreme that no vehicle would surpass it until the arrival of the T-80U in the late 1980s. The combination of cast geometry, advanced shaping, and massive raw thickness gave it effective resistance against all known kinetic and chemical energy threats of its time, and even some that hadn't been fielded yet. Armed with the massive 130mm M65 rifled gun, assisted by an auto-loading mechanism and stabilized for firing on the move, the 279 brought firepower to match its armor. Internally, it carried full NBC protection, fire suppression, and even climate control. On paper, it was a Cold War juggernaut. Survivable, powerful, mobile, and terrifying. But reality set in quickly. Field trials in 1959 revealed major flaws in the chassis. Despite its theoretical flotation, it struggled on sticky terrain. The four-track layout reduced agility and was hard to repair. The suspension was complex and maintenance intensive, and the overall vehicle height, despite its flat profile, couldn't be lowered further. Then came July 22, 1960, and the final blow. During a demonstration at Kapustin Yar, Nikita Khrushchev banned all tanks over 37 tons, instantly canceling the entire heavy tank program. Object 279, the most ambitious, expensive, and specialized of the three prototypes, alongside the 277 and 770, was quietly retired without ever entering service. And yet its legacy endured. In fact, before its cancellation, Object 279 had even flirted with radical firepower concepts, not just one but four distinct attempts to push its combat capabilities beyond anything fielded before. The first was the experimental AK Strela system, centered around an 85mm ultra-high velocity gun. 
Instead of relying on massive calibers, the Soviets aimed for sheer kinetic energy, pushing speeds to 1,550 meters per second. A full-scale mock-up confirmed that the smaller caliber allowed for double the ammo load, up to 60 rounds, while improving loader efficiency through a new mechanized system. But the trade-offs were harsh. Turret imbalance, reduced gun elevation, unstable internal ballistics, and poor barrel longevity ended the concept before it left the testing phase. The second attempt pushed the idea even further. The GN85-175 deep rifling gun. This system removed the recoil mechanism entirely, fixing the gun rigidly in the turret and using a spring-loaded turret suspension to absorb the shot. The projectile was guided by a star-shaped sabot designed to maximize gas efficiency and deliver muzzle velocities approaching 2,000 meters per second. Tests showed promising penetration estimates, but accuracy and barrel wear were catastrophic. The gun was physically viable, but tactically unworkable. Then came the third concept, bore enlarged variants of the M65 itself, including a 140 mm smoothbore version called the M65GL. It was intended to fire fin-stabilized subcaliber rounds derived from the Turan project. While the design improved range and penetration, it required significant internal redesigns and never reached prototype testing. The final effort came in the form of modernization through platform evolution. By the late 1970s, the firepower spirit of the Object 279 returned, not in a four-track tank, but in the Object 785. Built on a stretched T-80 chassis, it retained the heavy-hitting philosophy and even tested a 130mm rifled gun derived from the same M65 family. While this time, the platform was lighter, more agile, and better suited to modern logistics, it marked the final echo of the Soviet heavy tank doctrine. None of these efforts succeeded, but they left behind a trail of bold engineering, each iteration reflecting the USSR's desperate push to dominate future battlefields, even if reality, physics, and politics refused to cooperate. Even after being dropped to battle rating 9.0, it can still wipe the floor with most opponents. Its frontal armor shrugs off nearly anything, and even when facing APFSDS shells, the 279 often comes out on top. But here's the real question. Is the Object 279 historically accurate in War Thunder? And the answer is, surprisingly, yes. Out of every vehicle we've looked at so far in this series, the Object 279 is actually one of the most historically faithful tanks in the entire game. From its weight, to its dimensions, to its crew layout, engine power, top speed, and even the unique four-track suspension, almost everything is spot on. There are only two small differences between the in-game model and historical documentation. One, the BR-48 2B shell is slightly nerfed. The only armor-piercing shell available in-game, the BR-482 b is historically correct in shape and velocity curve. However, it's a little underloaded. According to declassified documents and internal Soviet sources, the BR-482B was filled with 125 grams of A92, a powerful plastic explosive with a TNT equivalence of 1.54 times. In War Thunder, that value is listed as 115 grams, which equates to approximately 177 grams of TNT equivalent, about 10 grams short of the real thing. 2. The shell's velocity is slightly understated. According to Domestic Armored Vehicles 1945-1965 to by M.V. Pavlov and I.V. Pavlov, the BR-482B had a muzzle velocity of 1,030 meters per second when fired from the M65. In War Thunder, the shell is modeled at 1,000 meters per second, 30 meters per second short of the historical value. Now comes the hardest part, ballistic reconstruction. And right from the start, let's be clear, reconstructing the exact ballistic behavior and ammunition types used by the Object 279 is extremely difficult. Much of the documentation is either fragmented, classified, or misinterpreted, even in popular publications. One example is a Reddit post from user Robert Men Beyer about five years ago. He claimed the Object 279 fired an APDS round and even shared a photo, which, after deeper research, turned out to be a mislabeled image of experimental 85mm projectile models for the AK Strela Ballistic Launcher, 1959. Some sources and fan sites still claim the 279 used APDS. They usually cite the table from Domestic Armored Vehicles, 1945 to 1965, which at first glance lists an APDS shell. But when you look closely, the table includes four asterisks next to the entry. And in the legend, that means for an armor-piercing projectile. There are no armor-piercing subcaliber ones. In other words, the claim that the Object 279 fired APDS is not supported by the source itself. 
We also can't confirm the muzzle velocity of the OF482MHE shell when fired from the M65. However, considering the M46 field gun, which used the same ammo types, fired both the BR482 and OF482M at identical velocities, it's likely that the same would apply to the M65. But again, without a confirmed source, it remains speculative. Things get messier. In that same book, the BR482 shell is listed with a weight of 30.7 kilograms, while actual data shows 33.4 kilograms. A big difference. If you're thinking the B variant is heavier, think again. Declassified CIA firing tables for the 130mm M46 gun explicitly state that BR482 and BR482B have no relevant ballistic differences. They share the same shape, velocity, and penetration profile. And finally, let's talk about barrel length. Depending on the source, the M65 is listed as 56 calibers, 59 calibers, or even 60 calibers long. Why the confusion? Some sources may include the breech in their measurements, others may not. If you calculate based on the rifled barrel length alone, it comes out to 56 calibers, which seems to be the most physically consistent figure. In short, the M65's ballistics are well documented in some areas, but clouded by misquotes, assumptions, and broken references in others. That's why it's so important to vet every source and to be transparent when the data just doesn't exist. Now for the ballistics itself. Even if it's not 100% accurate, we reconstructed both penetration tables to compare the in-game object 279 with its real-life potential. But there's a chance the second table we used might actually come from IS-7 trials, not the Object 279, since the original source doesn't specify the gun. Given that the M65 and S70 shared the same BR-482 ammunition, this kind of confusion isn't surprising. In War Thunder, the BR-482B is modeled with a slightly reduced velocity, 1,000 meters per second, and a penetration curve that diverges sharply from historical estimates. At zero degree impact, the game overestimates performance by plus 13.9 to plus 15.9% across all distances. At 30 degrees, the deviation ranges from plus 1.7 to plus 5.9%, still favoring the in-game performance. At 60 degrees, however, War Thunder begins to underestimate the shell's effectiveness, with values between negative 7.6% and plus 2.1% compared to the reconstructed Soviet data. Of all the vehicles we've explored in this series so far, the Object 279 stands out, not just for its bizarre looks or its nuclear era origins, but because it's one of the most accurately represented tanks in War Thunder. Its armor layout, spot on. Suspension design, nailed. Weight, dimensions, crew layout, internal systems, all match the historical record with impressive precision. Even its in-game performance reflects reality. The Object 279 was a juggernaut, and it plays exactly like one. There are a few small differences. The shell is slightly underloaded, and the penetration values lean a bit optimistic at flat angles. But that's to be expected. Since 2019, Gaijin has used its own in-house penetration calculation system, which doesn't always align with historical test data. It's not inaccurate just different and consistent within the game's balanced philosophy. And what about that mysterious APDS shell? Well, let's just say the evidence is thin. Some claim it existed, others say it didn't. But until real documentation emerges, that story will stay in the shadows. If you enjoyed this deep dive, consider joining the channel's Patreon, where you'll get early access to upcoming videos, behind-the-scenes content, and exclusive research breakdowns that don't make it into the final cut. And if you want to discuss tanks, tactics, or just nerd out about armor with like-minded people, hop into the community Discord server. The link is in the description. Drop a like if you learned something new, and leave a comment if you've got your own theory about that APDS shell. And don't forget to subscribe, because we've still got a lot of Cold War madness to uncover. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.